prepared this morning, but um, this morning we're going to be continuing our study in Matthew chapter 18. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 35. Now, there's three things that we can say really characterize the world and the world's way of thinking. One is that there's no sense of an objective truth, an objective standard on which we base our lives. Secondly, because of that, no one sees, or people don't generally see the need to repentance, for repentance or for a change of life. And also connected with that, as we're going to look at today, neither do they see the need for forgiveness. And yes, when you look at the, as far as our relationship with God, we're talking about forgiveness with him, but also to seek forgiveness from one another. Last week, we uh, looked at how we as Christians are to deal with a brother or sister in the Lord that sins against us. We're first to go to them individually. When we believe someone's wronged us in some way and as Jesus said there if they repent if they turn you've won your brother you've restored that relationship if then they don't repent at that point take two or three others with you because as he quotes from the Old Testament from the law out of the mouth of two or more witnesses anything will be established the facts will be established and then if he doesn't listen to them then it goes before the church the question then arises on our perspective exactly how far are we to extend forgiveness and that's what we're going to take a look at today Because at this point, there at the beginning of verse 21, we see Peter comes along. And the first principle we're going to look at here in verses 21 through 28 is that forgiveness is an identifying characteristic of the believer. Probably second only to love. As it says here in verse 21, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? The willingness to forgive others is is an essential indicator that someone has received forgiveness from God. You're not saved by forgiving others, but if you have truly received forgiveness from God, as a result of that, you'll become more forgiving. You'll continue. Again, it's one of those characteristics that as a believer, we should constantly be growing in. We should be growing in our love. We should be growing in forgiveness. We should be growing in these things. And the interesting point here is, as we remember the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, it's the only part of the Lord's Prayer that was elaborated on, that Jesus elaborated on after he recited that prayer. Now, Jesus had just described, again, how we're to deal with sin among believers in the church. Now, the disciples were probably, as I said before, after this, having one of those, their fireside conversations. And, they thought, and you could see them having this discussion, oh, okay, 
were supposed to forgive. And you could see them kind of discussing or debating among themselves, well, how many times are we supposed to forgive? Rabbinic tradition said that you were to forgive as much as three times. Get one, okay, forgave you one time. Did it again, ooh, yeah, I'll forgive you that time. Uh, You did it to me again, three times. Three strikes, you're out, man. I'm not forgiving you anymore. But the question is for us, really, when we look at this in perspective, how many times has God forgiven us for the same thing? When we've done the same thing. Peter thought he was really being spiritual here. It's like, hey, Lord, I'm growing now. I got this. I know the, Phar- or the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rabbis, all the rabbis of the past say, we should forgive three times. But now we know you, Lord. We're growing in you. We're getting real spiritual here now. Can we, should we? How about seven times? Is that a good limit? After all, isn't seven that perfect number? The problem is that Peter and the disciples were still thinking in worldly terms as it relates to forgiveness. After all, isn't there a limit to human endurance? There's only so much I can take, like Popeye. This is all I can stand because I can't stand no more. The issue, though, is that we who have been born of the Spirit are not to walk in the works and limitations of the flesh or natural man. We're not to say, hey, I'm only human. Well, the question is, what kind of human are you? Are you a redeemed or an unredeemed human. You see, we're not to be depending on just our own limitations. We're to seek the working of God in our hearts, realizing that for that the forgiveness that we ourselves have, we have received. So Jesus in verse 22 goes on to say, it says, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Jesus responds to Peter in a way that was not expected. You know, he probably expected a pat on the back here and said, oh, Peter, you got it, man. You're really spiritual. You know, I see you're floating off the ground there. The Lord said, that we are to forgive 70 times 7 times. Now, in Genesis 4.24, we have the account of Lamech, the grandson of Cain. Lamech, and it reads there, Lamech had... Then, it says, Then Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zila. Hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech shall be, then Lamech. And New King James reads 77fold, but other translations read, you know, in dealing with the numbers there, 70 times 7. And it would seem that Jesus is making an allusion to this, you know, a reference back to this account when he says, you know, if he can hold a grudge 70 times 7, you know, basically forever, 
if you are a born again believer if you are walking in the Lord the requirement is 70 times 7 and of course you can calculate that easily if you're an elementary math student and figure out that's 490 times now if you're thinking 490 times legalistically what a bummer because imagine if you're counting okay they sinned against me here we are at at 383 and what if you lose count start over over, right i'll keep going see that's the point jesus wasn't saying literally you know you know for everybody you have to have a tally you know everybody you know you have you know you're putting the hash marks there and you're adding it up and as soon as they okay i can write that person off now because they reach 490 no the point is it's supposed to be considered an innumerable amount of times an unlimited number if a carnal man is capable of unlimited vindictiveness a man indwelt by the spirit should be capable of unlimited forgiveness now I realize there's those times when you've been hurt so bad and you think Lord I just cannot forgive you're right in your own flesh you can't you can't it's that's the point we're making here he's making here is you can't do it yourself you can be hurt so bad that you come to the point and you have to say lord i can't forgive this person lord would you work this in my heart would you work forgiveness in my heart as is always the case the working of God is not done by our personal might or power but by, is accomplished by the spirit of God as we read in Zechariah 4 6 not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the Lord secondly in verses 23 through 27 we see that we need to realize how much we have been forgiven as it says in verses 23 to 25 therefore The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made now Jesus illustrates his point with this parable of the kingdom of how things are in the kingdom of heaven as he describes a certain king who decided he needed to settle his accounts with his servants now the servants of a king back then functioned as like a civil servant that did the king's bidding whatever he had you know he gave them to do so he gave them money to do their jobs he gave them the resources they needed and he then expected some return from that so as he began this pol- this process of reconciling his books this guy was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, when we look at this today, we have a hard time grasping this because we don't weigh things in talents. We don't measure things in talents. We think of talents as skills, abilities. But what a talent was at the time, at, in this day, it was the highest unit of measure by which you could measure something especially well especially monetarily 
It referred to the amount of silver or gold a soldier could carry on his back, which was between 75 and 100 pounds. Now, to figure out exactly how much this is, now, when you read commentators, you get a really wide range on how much money this could be that we're dealing with here. So what I did was I took the lower end, 75 talents. And yesterday, the price of gold per ounce was $1,250. So the minimum value that this servant owed in current U.S. dollars is $15 billion. Now this shouldn't be surprise, surprising. He worked for the government. <laughs> Only a government employee could waste that much money. But the point that the Lord is making is that that servant owed so much, such a great amount, that there's no way he could ever pay it. You see, to put it in perspective, you know, as he'd said, he owed 10,000 talents. The entire revenue of Judea, Samaria, and the Galilee at this time was only around, per year was only around 900 talents. So how many years would it take from the whole gross domestic product to even get up to that? A long time. That's a number I didn't figure. The application is obvious. How much has each one of us been forgiven? A great amount. How much do we owe the Lord because of our own sin? If we were to measure every sinful thought and action we ever had or did we would see that our debt is much higher than this servant's. As was the custom in this day, the king, and it's interesting here in the passage, it switches from identifying him as a king to identifying him as Lord. Making the analogy even more clearly, but as was the custom, the king or lord ordered that he and his family were to be sold into slavery to pay the debt. That is what sin does to a person. It enslaves them. Jesus in John chapter 8 beginning with verse 31 says it says then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him if you abide in my word you are my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free they answered him we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone how can you say you shall be made free Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, he who commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, to give you some more figures. The price of a slave during the first century was 500 denarii or denarii however you want to pronounce that now a denarii is a 
day's wage for the average worker. I figured that in current U.S. terms. The current average daily wage for someone in America is $212.40. If you multiply that by 500 times, you get a value of $106,200. But no matter how many people this guy had in his immediate family, he could still never pay the debt. It would never reach $15 billion. Continuing in verse 26, just a second here. Let's take that and think about it ourselves. You've heard the song. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't owe. There's no way we could ever pay the debt that we're indebted to God. As much as people try, as much as people get this mentality, oh, Lord, just be patient with me. In fact, that's what he goes into next. The servant, therefore, fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. The servant did the only thing that he could do. He cried out for mercy. And asked for patience. He thought that if only he had more time, he could pay the money back. That's funny how people with a worldly mindset, worldly perspective, think that if you add more time to something, it solves all the problems. How many times do we think that if we only had more time, we could work out our debt to God? Lord, just give me more time and I'll work it out. The king was moved with compassion and forgave the debt. This is an incredible thing about our debt to the Lord. Is when we go to him, receive Jesus Christ as the total payment for our debt, our incredible surmounting debt of sin, he has compassion and forgives totally. Our debt is wiped out by the blood of Christ so that we are free from that immediately. And that's the reason for this word that we have up here. Joy. Because apart from that, apart from really knowing forgiveness... We can experience real, true joy. Knowing that there is no longer anything separating me from God. So that now we no longer seek to serve God out of obligation, but out of gratitude. Paul, with this attitude, declared to the Romans. He declared himself to be a debtor to the, to the Gentiles, both Greeks and barbarians, 
for the sake of the gospel. He said his mindset was God forgave me so much and in a sense obligates me. I'm therefore obliged to seek as many peace people as possible to experience that same forgiveness. Now, thirdly, we see that we need to be willing to forgive others from the heart. As we read beginning in verses 28 through 30. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his servant. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. After the first servant had been forgiven, he went out there and found a fellow servant who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, again, figuring from today's standards, the amount that he owed him, and again, on American standards, is $21,240. And so that first servant abusively demanded repayment and his fellow servant begged him for patience with exactly the same words that that first servant had appealed to his master with have mercy on me begging him just give me more time and I'll repay He didn't have the same heart of compassion as his Lord. And he threw his fellow servant into prison. Now if you think about this, and again, I kind of went geeky on the math here. When you compare the two debts, proportionally, what his fellow servant owed him was one over 706,000, oh, excuse me, 706 million That's the comparison. What, of what his debt was to the king. We read in Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we, will, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. Now in verses 31 through 34, we read, So, when this when his fellow servants, all the other servants of the household, the kingdom, saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, 
after he had called him in, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that is due him. The other servants saw everything that had taken place and were grieved at the incredible hypocrisy of the first servant. They went and reported it to the king. You know, and again, looking at the analogy here in this parable that Jesus is making, you're in serious trouble when you've done something that other believers find it necessary to pray against, to pray about. After he had informed after he had been informed, the king calls the first servant in and refers to him as, you wicked servant. And this is the same description in a similar parable, the parable of the talents, where the guy who had the one talent who buried that talent, Jesus also referred to as a wicked servant. What identifies someone as a wicked servant is that they really haven't gotten a grasp, especially here on forgiveness. They haven't gotten a grasp on, you know, what exactly it means. And it's a tragedy when you see people that maybe have come to church for years and years and years and still leave, lead lives that indicate they haven't gotten a handle on forgiveness or what it means to be forgiven. As a pastor, there's nothing more tragic to see than that. The wicked servant was shown incredible mercy but would not show any to his fellow servant. The expectation upon those who have been shown mercy is to in turn then show mercy to others. And that's what we're called to do. But instead, he refused and so the king gave him what he really deserved and sent him to the torturers until he paid that debt that he couldn't possibly pay. This is what happens when we refuse to forgive. We're tortured with bitterness and it tears us up inside. It doesn't affect the person that we refuse to forgive. It affects us. And then in verse 35, Jesus says, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Now this kind of gets to the heart of what forgiveness looks like. What does it look like? How does it play out practically? When a brother or sister wrongs me in some way, I need to immediately forgive from the heart. Flip to here to Ephesians 4.32 for a second. Verse 
in this paragraph, starting with verse 25, Paul is talking about not grieving the Holy Spirit. In verse 25, he talks about putting away lying. Verse 26, about being angry and not sin, not letting the sun go down on our anger so that we don't give a place to the devil. Stop stealing. Kind of obvious. But labor. That we'd have something to give other people. Not to let corrupt speech come out of our mouth but what's necessary for edification and not to grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed to the day of redemption and then verse 31 it says let all bitterness wrath anger clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another tender tender hearted forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. That's the measure. That's the standard. If someone sins against me, remember how much I've sinned against the Lord and how many times he's forgiven me. This prevents me from becoming bitter and unforgiving. And it then leaves the ball in the other person's court. Even though, but you might ask, how does this work out personally? And you think, do you know, this person's wronged me. I've forgiven him in my heart. But then, how, you know, what, how does this play out? How far is it to go? How do I then just say, oh, you're forgiven, and, and then say, oh, everything's cool, forgetting everything that they did to you? Is that possible? You see, it's possible to forgive them from your heart and that's the important thing for us to do because it then, as I said, takes it off of us and that we don't fester in bitterness. But if that person does not repent and make things right, it affects relationship. And in fact, reconciliation. And so, there is still, still a strain. But as soon as a person apologizes and repents, I can show him that he's forgiven by telling him and demonstrating you know I personally have to let it go I have to let it go but if the person continues it goes back to the case that we saw last week if they continue and sinful behavior. They're to be treated with the consequences appropriate for that. But you see, the central thing that Jesus is getting at here isn't that point. We really covered that last week. The point that he's getting to is that we need to be forgiving people. Our focus shouldn't be, and again, this is where the whole bitterness thing plays in, shouldn't be, oh, what they did to me, what they did to me, what they did to me. Because you have no control over that. What you have control over 
is your ability to forgive. And that's what, that what you need to focus on. Being willing to forgive. So as forgiven people, we are to be forgiving people. Forgiveness is that identifying characteristic of a believer. We need to realize how much we have been forgiven. That debt we couldn't ever possibly pay. And so we look to the Lord for his mercy. And we need then to be willing to forgive others not just superficially. Oh, we're good at that. Pat, oh, I forgive you. And then we go off and fume. But no, as Jesus said, to forgive from the heart. A good question for ourselves is what does my, your ability or inability to forgive reveal about where you're at in your relationship with the Lord you know as I said there's always those things that we can hold on to and personally having grown up in an alcoholic household you know there's a way you can, you can look at things I remember when my father died. It was when I was in seminary. And I remember telling my advisor there who was asking me how I was doing because of it. I said the greatest, probably the greatest difficulty I had was unresolved issues. You know, not feeling that the relationship had really been restored because my father was always my father the man that he was but what I realized was it was necessary for me in order to get freedom to not repeat you see this is what often takes place and we see this played out in society when we see how Abusers often, uh, people who are abused often become abusers because they focused on that sin and they perpetuate it. And the same thing is true with a situation like alcoholism. Children of, al- of alcoholics often themselves become alcoholics. Why? I don't believe it's a disease. I don't believe it's hereditary. I believe it's the sins of the fathers visiting themselves upon the sons to the third and fourth generation of those who don't believe. But at any point in time, we're called as believers to stop the cycle and forgive. And once we forgive, we have then freed ourselves from that, if you will, curse. And no, I don't believe in generational curses, so you don't have to worry about that one. But we don't have to fear perpetuating it. You see, I had to forgive my father so I didn't so I wouldn't become my father we have to forgive those who have sinned against us those who have done something against us so that it doesn't continue it's not just about us it's not just about what somebody else did to us it's about the difference that Jesus makes in our lives It's about realizing how much he's done for us. And if I owed him a debt so great, it was so much greater 
than anything my father ever did to me. Then by, then by the working of his spirit in my heart and in my life, I can forgive. So, I would just encourage you. Most of us have some situation like that. Some circumstance, some situation of someone that we feel that in our own strength we can't forgive. You're right. In your strength, you can't. But as Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's how people, you want to be thinking about the holidays and spending time with relatives. It's usually one of those people who did it to you. But when you go back, if you can go back in the spirit of God, forgive that person. Even if you don't say it, if you show it. Although it's highly likely that it'll be necessary to say it. They'll see such a difference that it'll be a testimony to the work of Christ in your life. And that's what he's called us to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again so much for your forgiveness to us, Lord. Your forgiveness for us. And Lord, we just pray. Lord, I pray for everyone in the fellowship here, Lord God. You know, as we've talked about these things today and the need for forgiveness, there's probably been that person who's popped up in their mind. That's wronged them. It's sinned against them, Lord. Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy 